right. Can people hear me? Good. All right, I'm Anna, and I'm going to talk about joint work with Lim and Gian Frank Fenning, all at Carnegie Mellon University. So I'm not going to start my talk with a tale of two calculi, but I do have a tale of a very ugly distributed system, which looks even uglier on the big screen. So this is a distributed system that is doing some sort of distributed computation. And the idea is that every co component has a role or a job as part of the computation. And because it's a distributed system, each component or node is a unique point of failure. So let's assume that something goes wrong in this system. Some component is not following their prescribed role. Well, how do we tell? I don't know anything about this system. I don't know what languages the nodes are written in. There might be in different ones. Well, let's assume that by some miracle, I know that this particular node is the one that went off script, that it has gone rogue. So now the question is, well, is that the original node that went off script? Is that the root of the problem? Is that the correct node we need to blame? Well, not necessarily, right? The problem could have st started way earlier and just been observable now. So that's the question I want to try to answer in this talk. So I'm going to talk about two main contributions. The first is this work uses session types to dynamically monitor communications between processes to, with the goal of detecting undesirable behavior. Second, we want to correctly blame the party that violated the prescribed communication <coughs> protocol. And this previous speaker did a very good job introducing session types, so I just want to remind you that we use session types to uh, model processes that interact with each other because they have this nice property of the session type changes as the communication progresses. And when I say correctly blame, what I mean is we want to, we want to be able to say which process started the wrong behavior. So we want to give you a set where we guarantee that the original bad process is in the set. So I mentioned that we're going to use session types for dynamic checking. Why don't we do static checking? Well, first of all, like I said, we don't really have any information about these systems. And we don't want to make assumptions about what languages they're written in. So if we use static checking, well, I would need a static checker for each node, and that would be a whole lot of static checkers. Also, I think it's unrealistic to assume that we'll always have access to the whole computing base. Whereas in our approach, we use session types as invariants, and then we can check them dynamically. So let's talk about our process model. So in our model, we have processes, and processes talk to each other over channels. And there's a queue that sits in each channel. And the idea of this queue is that it acts as a message buffer, so for asynchronous communication. So we say that our process provides a service along a single channel. Something like proxy P means we have a process named P, which is providing a service along channel C. And here, here we see that there's a queue that will store any um, message that P might want to send or whatnot. And we have the invariant that a process can be a client of, may, of many other processes, but it can only provide a service along one channel. So be a client on many channels, but only provide a service along one. So our invariant is each channel has a unique, sort of it connects exactly two processes. And, and this is our linearity assumption. So this is our main typing judgment, and the idea is, is just what, I, just what I stated, we have a process P that's providing some service along channel C with type A. And this process can make use of these other channels C1 through CN. And these C1 through CN have types A1 through AN. So my channel names are in purple, my session types are in red, and my process is in green. And again, process is providing along a single channel, but may be a client of multiple channels. So if some of this talk of linearity is reminding anyone of linear logic, well, you're right. Session types are a Curry-Howard um, interpretation of intuitionistic linear logic. So I'm just going to review some session types. So first, there are the simplest session types there are. The first one is just you, you want to go ahead and send some value of type tau along a channel, some, a channel C, and it's tau and a, basically send something of type tau, continue as a. The dual is this, is the next line. We've got a channel C of type tau arrow a. So we're going to receive some value of type tau, continue on as a, and we've got uh, just a termination type. So these are all sort of simple session types. So now let's talk about the higher order ones, the interesting ones. So when I say higher order in this context, I mean that we can send channels along channels, which is where the interesting behavior happens. So first I have something of type A tensor B, 
which means I'm going to send some channel D of type A along C, continue on as B. And the dual, I have um, A lolly B, which means receive some channel D of type A along C and continue on as B. So when we're actually doing these send and receive, these higher order situations, we're actually going ahead and spawning off new channels, Ds of type A. And finally, this was also mentioned in the prior talk, we've got an internal external choice. And this is, I've marked the labels in blue. And the idea is either internally or externally, you make a, cho a choice is made of what service um, we, we would like to use, and then we continue on as uh, the type that corresponds to it. So let's look at an example. This example is based off of a life problem that I have. I keep my phone in my pocket, and my phone camera is always taking pictures without my knowledge, so I end up with a ton of pictures of I don't know what. So I would really, really like for my camera on my phone to ask me every time whether I'm sure I want to take a picture. So I can model this with session types. How exciting. So I can go ahead and write a session type that models the camera process and a session type that models the user process. So first, let's take a quick look at the picture. The idea is, is I have some operating system, my phone, that's going to tell the camera, I want to take a picture. And the camera is going to ask the user, well, are you giving me permission? And the user is going to internally make a decision about whether they want to give permission or not and send back uh, this permission. The camera will take a photo. So in the type language, the camera process is an external choice because the camera offers a service that anyone can query can request. There's only one service offered. It's take. And the service, what it's going to do is it's going to um, it's going to receive a, a, a photo permission channel. It's going to contain a photo permission. And then once it has that, it will go ahead and um, produce a picture handle channel, a channel with a handle to an image, and then continue on as the camera. And the user type is similar, so we also have an external choice with uh, one possible functionality of pick request. Anyone can ask the user, hey, can you, will you okay me to take a picture now? And this actual pick request is an internal choice because it's up to the user to decide whether they would like to fail or succeed. So if the user decides to fail, they just continue on as the user, they don't send anything, they don't want to take a picture. And if the user continues to succeed, they're going to go ahead and send along uh, a photo permission channel and continue on as the user. So a couple of points is, first of all, we see that we are making use of a bunch of higher order types. We're sending along channels. And second is what I personally find most exciting about this approach is the fact that I'm only modeling the communication between processes. I've said nothing about how the user or the operating system or the camera are implemented. So what are the assumptions that we make in our um, system, in our monitoring system, which I'm going to talk about next? So first, we don't trust any processes. As far as I know, they're all bad, they're all rogue. But I do trust my monitors and my messaging queues. So I assume that there's some like network layer that does this all for me because I really, really don't want to think about it. So it seems silly to me to talk about monitoring before I talk about an attack model. Like what is it, what am I considering an attack? So I consider an attack when a process is taken over by another process. So it's being replaced by some rogue process. So what do I mean? I have some process proxy P, so some P is providing a service along channel C, and all of a sudden it becomes proxy Q. By all of a sudden I mean it makes the state transition change as shown by this arrow. And this type of transition we call havoc. And havoc transitions for us are not well typed. We don't in no way consider this something that we want to happen. This is a transition to ill typed code. And and there's one limitation on the attack that I want to mention because it's important. Is if you notice, we have like, though there's a different process, the channel C has remained consistent. And that's because we make the assumption that our attacker has to have some knowledge of the existing channels in the system. They can't go ahead and just make up some new channels or forge some channels. So they have to sort of have seen some of the channels. So like I said, Q doesn't invent new channels, must know about existing ones. So what can our monitors do and how do they work? So we place monitors at both ends of our monitoring queue. And the reason we place them at both ends is because our channels are bidirectional, and the queue is the one that maintains the direction. So we want them at both ends. And the idea is, is the monitor is just a type checker, and it's going to check um, values as they come in, and they're enqueued into the queue. It's not going to check them again at DQ. Again, communication is asynchronous. There's no need. 
And our monitors can only observe communicated values. They have no knowledge of any sort of process internals. They have no knowledge of other monitors, nothing like that. And what our monitor does is when they detect a type violation, they raise an alarm and they stop computation immediately. So I'm going to show you a simple example. So here I have two processes. I have process Q and process P. So process Q is providing a service along channel C. And this channel C happens to have type in and A. And process P wants to be a client of this process um, Q. Process P is also providing a service along channel A, but it's not pictured on the slide because it's not relevant. We're only talking about channel C. So you might notice our communication is going right to left. Sorry, I was feeling rebellious. So, and perhaps reading too much Hebrew. <laughs> this has recently come to my attention. I was like, I'm not changing my slides at this point. It is what it is. Okay, so let's say that process Q wants to, wants to send the number five over to P. So what are we gonna do? So nothing too exciting here. We're gonna go ahead in this right side, right-handed monitor is gonna go ahead and say, well, is five of type int or not? And five is of type int, so five is gonna go into the queue. And as soon as that happens, the type of the channel C is gonna change to just A. Remember, session types change as we go through our communication. And again, I'm not waiting for any sort of DQ. I don't care, it's asynchronous, not my problem. So what about if I didn't send five, but I sent a string, sort of say my favorite string ever, sloth. So if I tried to send this, this string sloth, what would happen is the monitor would try to type check, say sloth of type int, sloth is not of type int, so we would get an alarm and the, and the computation would just stop. Okay, so let's talk about higher order monitoring, which is a little more interesting. So again, same setup. But this time, Q wants to send a channel D to P. And we have this problem of, I can't look inside this channel. I have no idea what's gonna happen later on this channel. I'm not equipped with these sort of see into the future capabilities. So what do I do? And here we're gonna do something similar to the higher order contract checking approach, which I like to call pass the buck and worry about it later, which is, we're just gonna say, okay, you know what, we don't know. Shove this um, channel D into our queue. So uh, my type changes to B, but we're also, what we, we are gonna do is we're gonna spawn off a new process, which I'm calling R, that is providing a service along this new channel D and wrap it in a monitor. So, this, so the idea is that when something happens later or never, that this monitor is gonna be monitoring this um, new process and channel with type um, A. And I just wanna make a note that when these spawns happen, the, um, the, the monitor that put D into this queue keeps track of this. This will be important later. So what are the monitoring challenges? Well, remember, I mentioned the fact that we have this linearity constraint of where we only want, so we have a channel that is like two endpoints very strictly. Processes can only provide a service on one channel but be client on multiple channels. Well, it turns out when we have havoc transitions, all of that goes to hell. We can have channels be dropped, duplicated, and we get really, really ugly things. And the main problem is we can get cyclic dependencies. So this is just a tiny picture with three processes in blue. So these yellow arrows denote um, spawns, like processes spawning, which are reasonable, and this red arrow is bad because it creates a cycle. And we don't want cycles in our system. Cycles are hard to monitor, cycles are hard to blame. Cycles are what make, part of the reason that this work is challenging. So, Let's talk through a blame example. So we're back to our camera with our session type from before. So we start out with this camera process. And this camera process, at this point, nothing has happened. So our monitor has recorded nothing interesting. So our camera process is going to spawn off the photo permission process. And our monitor is going to record that this took place. So, and then our photo permission process is also going to record that there was a spawn to a new picture handle process. So at this point, we've recorded two spawns. Great. Let's say now we get an alarm. What do we do? Well, we don't have information about where exactly some sort of process replacement happened. And our first instinct might be to just go ahead and blame the process that alarmed. That's it. We know, it's, we know that one definitely has something wrong with it. That's it. We're done. Here's where the error is. But as I mentioned, there's a big difference between the origin of an error 
So a process being replaced by a rogue process and observable bad behavior, which can manifest many, many steps later and actually it can never manifest. So this is not in any way sufficient blame. So, well, the, well it's not necessarily sufficient blame, but so what do we do? So because our monitor has kept a record of the spawns, we can go ahead and go up the spawn graph. So we go up, we go up one more level because we want to include the photo permission process in case there was, that was the one that was originally compromised. But we're still not done because the camera process could have been the one that went wrong initially. So we're actually going to go up one last level until we reach the root of this spawning tree. And we, this set of three processes is going to be the blame set that is returned. And we guarantee that if there was an alarm at, at pick handle, then one, then one of these three processes is the process that went rogue. So this might be, that seems a little unexciting, right? I started with sort of a spawn tree of three and I blamed the whole tree. But Let's consider a much bigger spawn tree that has many, many spawn paths, and you can think of them as like many program executions. So, got a big tree, lots of paths. And even more, let's again remember that we can have these cycles that occur due to habit transitions. So we might have something that looks like this with you know, a bunch of cycles and many more paths all the way up to the root. So, if we have an alarm at this leftmost node over here, we have a challenge in finding which path to the root is going to be the single blame path that we guarantee is the one that was at some point um, had gone rogue. So based on our theory, which I'll talk about in more detail next, we actually guarantee that no matter what sort of havoc transitions happen or whatnot, we will return a single blame path up to the root that has to include the process that was initially uh, initially havoc or gone, initially went rogue. So theoretical results, I've hinted at the first one, correctness of blame. So we prove a, prove a theorem that our blame assignment is correct. We also prove that well-typed configurations don't raise alarms. We prove that our monitors are transparent. And finally, we provide case studies and show some conjectures about the fact that our blame assignment is minimal. So in more detail, what do I mean by uh, correctness of blame? So I mean that if there's an alarm, one of the indicated possible culprits must have been compromised. So we're sure that we're including the process that initially went wrong. Uh, next, well type configurations don't raise alarms. Basically, what that means is that we have, there has to have been a havoc transition somewhere made by some process that was taken over in order for the monitor to have alarmed and stopped execution. There's no way for that to happen without a habit transition. And uh, finally, transparency or monitor not, uh, the fact that a monitor is not observable is that dynamic monitoring doesn't change system behavior for um, well type processes. The monitor is sort of, if everything goes well, we can pretend uh, they don't exist. And I mentioned that we have this minimality um, conjecture. So we conjecture and provide case studies and examples to support the fact that the set of process blame processes that we return is as minimal as possible with respect to the observational model of our monitor. So the main, te the main technical results of this work are these, um, are these proofs. And the reason that they're so technically challenging is because execution frequently continues for many, many steps after the initial habit transition and we can actually observe a type violation. And these rogue process configurations that occur in the presence of these havoc transitions, they violate all sorts of invariants such as linearity and make it very, very hard to construct any sort of proof because you have so few assumptions to work with. So a lot of the technical challenge were actually constructing a proof framework where we could show any sort of interesting technical result in this sort of everything has gone to hell type um, framework. Uh, so, to uh, summarize, I presented a system of monitoring and blame assignment for session type asynchronous communication and, um, where we prescribe the, communi the communication protocol between processes using session type. I've also assumed an adversary model where processes can transition to ill-type code 
in um, habit steps with the constraint that our attackers can't see into, so have to be able to have knowledge of the channels and the processes that are talking to each other. Uh, more details about our monitor and exactly why we considered placing our monitors where we did and didn't use another approach as well as details about all the blame can be found in our paper for a lovely, lovely 30 plus page gory proof. You are welcome to check out our accompanying uh, technical report. So for some related work, related work in this area seems to fall into two categories. There's been a lot of work, a lot of it pre uh, presented at Popple on uh, blame calculi. So most of this work focuses on uh, functional languages, whereas we focus really on this sort of distributed, parallel, session type, processes talking to each other uh, model. And there's been work on multi-party session types, um, where Bachi and uh, uh, Chen do, so, uh, do some work in this space, but they don't concern themselves with blame assignment, and Thiemann does do blame assignment, but uh, our, our monitors are more local to our blame assignment and to be uh, more precise. And for future work, our main focus and what I'm trying to get myself up to speed and ready to do is to add dependent types to our system. And the reason why we're interested in this is with dependent types, we could go ahead and um, monitor many, many more interesting uh, protocols and protocol um, interactions. So. Uh, Thank you for listening. Hi. Um, so this is nice work, and I see how your attacker model makes sense in the parallel setting in which you can assume that I don't know, the OS sits between your processes and keeps track of these cues and makes the monitoring. Uh, I'm not really sure how you would really do this in practice in a distributed setting in which you would be adding extra nodes or how do you see this work in a distributed setting where, uh, where also the, the assumption that the network doesn't try to harm you is, is also not true. Right. So that's a good question. And we're sort of a point where we're starting to think about this. Because as you mentioned, I think I've made a reasonable case why this works in a parallel setting. But we're not quite there with a true, di true distributed setting. So we've been thinking about, like, do we need to place monitors instead of in the queues, place them on the nodes themselves in some way? Do we need to like add our extra trusted nodes in the middle of that host? host uh, that host this monitor, and we're still thinking about it. If you have any great ideas, I definitely welcome them because I really would like to get a PhD at some point. That would be good. So, uh, Bill Wadler, University of Edinburgh. Before I ask my question, I will, I'll give you another answer to Catalan's question, which is that um, we've got a joint project between Edinburgh, Glasgow, and Imperial called ABCD, again looking at session types. I'm sure you know about it. And we've got lots of work on doing this monitoring in practice, all done by Nabucco. So um, the answer to your question is standing behind me. And you should have a chat with Nabucco about the practical applications they have that do this kind of monitoring. The question I want to ask you is you had, uh, um, there's a saying that says, never attribute to malice what might be due to incompetence. And you've looked at this attacker model but it might be there's no attacker. You've just got some code, and somebody goofed while writing the code. So I think that's a much more common case. And um, I was going to ask how what you're doing applies in that case. And in particular, what I want to ask about is this theorem that says, oh, well, when everything's well typed, then you get no errors. Um, in gradual typing calculi, that's what the first theorems look like. You look at the early papers, and they all have a theorem that says, oh, and if everything's well typed, then there are no errors. I thought, OK, well, that's probably true, but it's not interesting. Right? And what blame is really interesting for is it lets you say if you've got two parties, and one is well typed, and the other is not well typed, and so might have errors, guess what? Turns out the errors always happen in the not well typed party. And blame is interesting because it lets you prove that at higher order. Have you thought about 
looking at that in your monitoring system? So, um, lots of points here. Yeah, first of all, I absolutely agree that attacker models sometimes seem a little too nefarious and some, someone could just write code that violates the prescribed communication, what, what they were supposed to be doing not out of malice or incompetence. So I actually think that this would transfer over reasonably well because you could, you could model the fact that someone sort of replaced what was supposed to happen in a process by a different process. Similarly, as we have stated, thank you for pointing out um, the joint project that's also a, uh, connected. And as to your last question, so yeah, I have looked at a lot of the gradual typing work, and really if things are well typed, they're boring, right? So we really, really, I think the interesting results here have to do with the fact that we can provide some blame assignment in the presence of these habit transitions. And the bulk of the work here has been proofs with the presence of these habit transitions. And where I see this work going is sort of, can we do blame when the types are more interesting, say dependent express much more interesting things than I sent an integer and I sent an integer and another integer. And in that case, blame would be harder to do, but also could distinguish between more interesting things, in my opinion. Hopefully that answers your question. So I have a simple question. What, uh, I don't understand your conjecture about minimality. And can you explain a bit more? Uh, sure. So, so we provide a blame set, so a set of processes that would say the original compromise process is in this set. So we conjecture that the set we provide to you is minimal with respect to our monitor. That is, we sort of, it's as small as it needs to be to capture the, the chain of processes that cause the problem. So we haven't proved this result, because I'm sure as many of you might surmise, proving minimality is horrible and awful and very hard, because you have to prove that if you remove any sort of, any potential process out of, out of that set, then that's not good enough. But we, we have examples in our paper, and we've worked out a ton, and it seems to be, so I just conjecture that our assignment is minimal with respect to our monitor. To, for, to be more precise, we would need to have our monitors be able to see more or be more powerful or whatnot, or make more assumptions. Yeah, thank you. So uh, your uh, session types are polarized, right? Can you talk louder, sorry? Your session types are polarized. Yes. Which requires to have explicit shifts. Yes. Given that most programming languages uh, that are used to program these distributed components together with stabs that are generated for those based on message protocols do not have shifts. How do you reconcile that with your assumption that uh, you don't have access to the code of the components? Good question. So, well, there are sort of two ways to sort of think about this. One of them is the thought of maybe so our language is polarized, as is described in the paper, but perhaps we can loosen that requirement. And perhaps there is a way to make this work without polarizing the types that would give us back more of the assumption of we don't need to know anything about uh, the languages of the uh, processes or whatnot. And then there's the other side, which is, you're right, most languages don't have any of this sort of shift. So do we, like, do we have to require language extensions or something on top of I'm more prone to the first approach than the issue. So let's thank Anna for the great presentation.